Oh, I had big dreams to be a star, my head filled up with glee. Now I'm so broke that I charge folks to live inside of me. Oh, Las Vegas, now don't you cry for me. I won't get fined if I sing lines from songs that are royalty free. Here, buy yourself some talent. Thank you, thank you, you're too kind. And coming up next on our Hell of a Bus Tour is Season 2, Episode 2. To your left, you'll see fans who consider it a flawless masterpiece, and to your right, you'll see some more disgruntled and disappointed peeps. Whichever side you're on, we sell color-coded shirts, hats, desert eagles, and nukes at the gift shop, so be sure to get those wallets out. Yup, Hell of a Boss Season 2 has barely even started, and it looks like we've got another episode that's been stewing in the callous cream of the controversy cake. Baked to perfection thanks to the heat of many smoldering hot takes. Now anyone who saw my circus review knows that I was extremely positive regarding that episode, even calling it one of my top 5 favorites. I've listened to arguments aplenty from multiple different sources, and I just couldn't understand why people weren't feeling this one. This episode was pee pee poo poo. I don't understand. But after my initial viewing of this episode, I definitely felt myself moving more towards the middle. Which is always the safest place to be during any internet argument, right? Yeah, maybe this was just me, but the first time I saw Seeing Stars, everything just felt so off to me. The animation felt off, the pacing felt off, the structure felt off, the story felt off. I've raised my eyebrows so many times, I probably could have designed a whole workout routine around it. But as most internet reviewers will tell you, you can often explain the botches after multiple rewatches. So after giving this app a few more chances, have my thoughts changed at all? Or will this be the very first hell of a boss episode that I can actually call yeah, like that would ever happen. It could. As always, if you have any thoughts on episode 2 or any thoughts on my thoughts, feel free to leave a comment below. But for now, let's join our favorite shooting stars as they turn LA into LA. You know, more than it usually is. Let's check out Hell of a Boss Season 2, Episode 2, Seeing Stars. To shoot for the stars. The episode starts off with... In the great expanse of the nether, there exist boundless amounts of magnificent phenomena. Uh... Stolas moonlighting as a planetarium tour guide? The planets, the stars, and all aspects of our universe began with a single legendary cosmic event known only as the Big Bang. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh my. Well, this is a different Big Bang, but... It's just as impressive as the real thing, I assure you. My eyes! Nah, it's just Stolas telling his little Octi about a cosmic phenomenon known as Azathoth's Tears. And he promises to take Octi to see this majestic marvel when it comes around again, which she's super excited about. Heck, this excitement is something that she carries even into her teenhood. Also, I'm just gonna say it, seeing Octi genuinely happy does more for me than Belphegor's entire drug ring ever could. Anyway, she pops downstairs looking for her pops, and it turns out that he's yelling at Stella over the phone about how he's been handling her possessions, since he demanded that she move out last episode. And holy cow is this scene freaking cathartic and satisfying. Seeing Stolas just be completely unhinged when yelling at his wife, and treating her prized possessions like the trash that she treated him like, is the perfect continuation of what I mentioned in my circus review. He's finally reached the level of a completely free bird, and he's just letting all that pent-up rage and fury flow out at once. Years and years of backed-up sewage ready to burst the pipe and drown this chicken toxicity. And I am all for it. Your mother is a f***ing... <laughs> Laura Mipsum... <laughs> Admitum Venium... But one detail I do appreciate is that he never addresses Octi with a frustrated or angry tone. I've seen too many shows where the main character explodes at someone they love, and it feels so forced every time. Here he's a little dismissive, sure, but never outwardly cruel. His anger is targeted at the person who deserves it, and I appreciate that. Obviously, Octi gets pretty peeved at Stoas' forgetfulness, and goes all wake me up inside on her own room. So with Daddy Dearest occupied, she decides to take matters into her own talons. She heads down to IMP, where Blitz and Luna are having a really violent argument. Trust me, we'll get to these two later. She snags the book from Blitz's private stash, and says, and I quote, 
Take Me to See the Stars, which ends with the book dropping her off on Hollywood's very own Walk of Fate. A minute, what? Since when was the grimoire a fast travel book with Siri integration? No one's ever had to speak in order to create a portal before. At least, not to my knowledge. I'll admit, the functionality of the grimoire hasn't always been super clear in the show. Like, at first we always saw IMP drawing pentagrams to position the portals, but then later on we never see them do that again. They make a big deal about needing to read the spell before you use it, but one time Luna just opens a portal by accidentally using the book as a coaster. It's confusing to say the least. But I definitely don't recall voice commands ever being in the grimoire's repertoire. And even if they were, you're telling me that a book with a clear emphasis on studying the cosmos is going to confuse these stars for these ones? And even if it was focusing on the actual stars, of all the places it could have taken her, why did it choose a smog-filled city where the stars are only barely visible at best? Heck, it's not even nighttime in this location where the stars would actually be out. Wouldn't it want to zap her to a place where you can actually see them better? Like a mountain in the wilderness away from the city? Or even one of those planetoids that Stolas took her to during You Will Be Okay? Wouldn't that make at least a little more sense? I don't know, maybe I'm just overthinking with portals, but considering the entire plot hinges on this weird misunderstanding, I have to admit that it does feel kinda contrived. Anyway, as Octavia wanders around the unhappiest place on Earth, Stoas and IMP team up to sniff her out. They agree that they're gonna need to disguise while walking around, the pupper and the birdo slip into something more human-like, and there he is. Human Stolas in all his fully colored glory. Check out that classy beanpole looking son of a gun. This fella's gonna turn heads all the way around if you know what I'm saying. I know we've only seen two members of the HB crew in human form so far, but it's amazing just how well the artists are able to translate their designs to look just like us. I expect that we'll be seeing all our favorite characters in Homo Sapien getup at some point, I just hope we don't have to wait multiple seasons to get to that point. Love your leg warmers. Nice ascot. Sadly, Stolas is unable to help Blitz disguise as well, since he says that his powers are limited without his book. And this actually leads to a bit of a snarky scuffle between the two fellas. One where Big Bird actually has the last laugh, which really surprised me. Now, I know what you're all gonna say. These two just had one of the worst nights of their lives, a night that the other had a massive hand in ruining, where tears were shed, reality was accepted, wounds were reopened, and booze was chugged till they blacked out drunk. And yet when they meet up again the next day, they're back to their same old casual flirty selves with nary a reference to what they've just been through. None of this makes any sense. That, 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 that can't be how it happened. Yeah, while this may seem like tonal whiplash at first, I actually think the Stolitz dynamic kind of makes sense here, and I've got plenty of reasons why. It's time for nobody's favorite game show, why Stolitz and Blitz's behavior in this episode is actually okay when you really think about it. Working title. Number one. Stolas not only feels empowered enough to chew out his wife for her abuse, but he even has enough confidence to strike back at Blitz when he's being sarcastic and or insulting. If you compare their exchanges here with their interactions throughout the series, especially in the circus flashback, you can tell that Stolas is a lot more passive and less willing to take jabs at Blitz. But in this episode, he straight up spits some fire and just struts away like a boss. That's an awesome way to show how free and confident he's become. Number two. While the duo does do some flirting here and there, it's more casual and less in your face. When Stolas flirted with Blitz in previous episodes, it always felt super aggressive and overplayed, which makes total sense. Being all lovey-dovey with an imp was an outlet where he could let out his repressed romantic desires after dealing with his abuser. And considering how she treated him, I don't blame him for saying darling and sweetheart and precious little imp over and over again. But now that he's given that slap happy chick what for, he doesn't need the outlet anymore. And he can just be a regular guy around Blitz with the occasional sultry remark every now and then. Like when he mentioned his performance in bed before Blitz goes on stage. Oh, and speaking of that scene... Number 3. Is it just me or is Blitz starting to show visual signs of reciprocating Stolas' affections? That's right, I saw your little smile after Big Bird said, Breathless. I've already mentioned how Blitz's attraction to Stolas has been perfectly outlined in the past, and how Blitz sees him as one of his best shots at a long-lasting relationship. But Stolas's obsessive flirting and sex talk always put forth the wrong messages, making Blitz constantly think it was just about sex and never about anything deeper. But now that Stolas has toned himself down a bit and the flirting is less constant, Blitz is probably able to enjoy it a lot more when it actually happens. 
Heck, you can even argue that Stoas acting more like a top by taking initiative, grabbing him and pushing him around is kind of a turn on for Blitz, but who am I to say? Number four, at this point it's no surprise that the personalities of these two kind of lend themselves to not addressing huge problems and instead sweeping them under the rug. As we've seen in episodes like Truth Seekers and The Circus, both of these walking disasters have a terrible habit of ignoring big issues and inescapable truths for long periods of time instead of tackling them head on like they know they should do. And while yes, the previous night both of them had a sort of revelation that maybe they should clean up their acts, we know that old habits die hard, so they're probably not quite ready to cross that bridge yet. Especially because... Number 5, there's a more pressing matter to attend to. This is probably the most understandable reason. Their daughter, and eventually daughters, are lost in the big city, they value them more than life itself, and they're more focused on bringing them home safely rather than worrying about their own problems at the moment. They'll probably have a big talk when things calm down, but for the time being, daddy-daughter rescue time is a lot more important. Thank you all for joining us, and we'll see you all next week! While I do admit that it does feel a little awkward to have absolutely no reference to their previous engagement at all, I still feel like this dynamic handles multiple things really well, and as long as we get an episode addressing it in the near future, I'm willing to let the lack of awkwardness slide. For now. The rest of the episode mostly just consists of a single gag where Blitz is swept up in the less than glamorous world of Hollywood stardom, and while on the topic of gags, the comedy is… pretty good. The idea of Blitz being mistaken for a cartoon parody of his voice actor is really funny, even if it is kinda overplayed. And it's nice to see that Brandon is down for some self-deprecation, like the way they made fun of his massive frickin' ears. It's good stuff. Who's the little man with the giant ears? I voted for him years ago. He bought me lots of beers. There are some classic gags like Blitz sarcastically asking what he should say to Stolas, and then it just smash cuts to him telling Stolas the same thing over the phone. I don't know what it is, but some of this show's funniest bits are always done over the phone. Some of the background gags made me chuckle, like that costume shop where Blitz bought his disguise literally just says, please take stuff on the sign. Stolas doing the eh throw from Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs was perfect. <laughs> and there are even some jokes with a tragic twist to them. Like when Blitz performs on a sitcom and thinks he's doing well, but it turns out that people are only laughing at him because of the teleprompter. Jeez, that's not just a tragic twist, that's a twist of the knife right there. Ouch. Honestly, this whole Blitz going on stage after a long time thing probably should have just been an episode all on its own. But by far the most consistent jokes in the episode are the constant jabs at Los Angeles living. Now, I've never actually been to the city, so I'm not really the best person to judge if this is accurate or not. Which is why I brought along a friend. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our first ever guest speaker, a veteran voice actor who's actually spent some time in old La La Land, William Patterson, aka The Wellstonator! If there's a will, there's a way, there's a way. If there's a will, there's a way, there's a way. If there's a will, there's a willy nilly way. Thanks for having me, Mr. Sentient Female Euphemism. And for the love of Stolas's bodacious bird cheeks, it's the Will Stonator. Not Sonator, not Stonator. Please get it the f right. <laughs> Anyways. Hello, my fellow Hell of a fans. How are you? Good to see you. Name's Will. I'm a voice actor and singer based out of Los Angeles, California. The City of Angels. I say sarcastically in quotation marks, cough, cough. As a local who has lived around the outskirts of this city my whole life, I will be your guide as we take a thorough look at each real-life Los Angeles landmark and all the gross details that come with them that the Vivzy Pop crew has brought to life. And I'm not exaggerating when I say that. You will, in fact, see every horribly accurate thing I list at least once should you willingly decide to travel to this beautiful city I call home. Oh, and by the way, Luna's absolutely right. It does smell like urine and desperation here. <laughs> no turning back now. You chose to be a part of this. So be sure to stay seated with your claws, tentacles, talons, and horns inside the... Wherever you're watching this from, and please, keep the puff puff passing to a minimum. Thank you! We begin our tour de- Oh my god, that shouldn't go there! Where Octavia ends up after stealing Dad's grimoire, Hollywood Boulevard. Come 
complete with the famous star-studded walk of fame. Beautiful palm trees that constantly add to our state's ever-growing wildfire problem, yet we refuse to chop down for some reason. A severe lack of green arrow traffic lights, no matter how much we beg for them. And homeless people that do, in fact, puke prophylactics. Yes, they actually do that here. But at least it's coming out of the attic and not the basement. <laughs> You better be careful where you walk on the street, or else you'll run into large groups of hyper-religious nutball protesters who literally scream protest over and over! Or even worse, SCAM ARTISTS! And no, I'm not talking about those annoying robocalls about your car's extended warranty that you never bought. I'm talking about SoundCloud rappers trying to sell you their free mixtapes. And I use the term free loosely. Or those nightmare-inducing costume performers that will charge you should you take a picture with them. So when we say no flash photography, we mean it. Your wallets will thank you immensely. But never mind all that, you want to see stars? Well, to your right, we can see Via as she travels around the gated houses of Beverly Hills, aboard one of our ethically questionable bus tours, where they do in fact blatantly show you the home addresses of your favorite celebrities for all your creepy stalker needs. Fun fact, the record is 15 restraining orders in a week. Think you got what it takes to be a star yourself? Then perhaps we can see Stolitz at one of our many studio buildings, where you can catch a glimpse of baby dolls snorting legal nose candy, overworked TV show staff members, or underpaid background actors being held hostage as a live studio audience who then film on-set fights on their phones purely for clout. But for those of you who just wish to take it slow, then you may want to look to your left for you'll see Blitz as he tries on costumes at any one of our three year-round Halloween stores on Magnolia Boulevard in Burbank. Oh, and if you look to your right, you can see Luna as she searches for Octavia at some of our other famous LA landmarks, such as Magic Castle, Universal Studios, the Hollywood Sign Viewpoint at Hollywood Reservoir, the TCL Chinese Theater, the Ovation Hollywood Center, and Griffith Observatory. And of course, what would a true Los Angeles experience be without airplanes flying overhead from either LAX or Burbank airports? Outdoor artist alleys endorsed by Verasica May Day, apparently. Criminally overpriced coffee shops. And the piece de resistance. Smog, glorious smog. Well, that pretty much wraps up my cameo. Thanks for joining us today. If you like what you see, please consider giving large amounts of praise to the Vivzy Pop crew. Because if I can get this invested in the backgrounds, and especially the Easter eggs of this episode, you know you've got a creative team who cares. Of course, we always love gushing about the songs, the voice actors, and of course the director. But this is the episode where it's the background artists who truly outdid themselves. The interior of Aussies may be the most beautifully complex, but it's seeing stars that can make any LA local look out the windows of their crowded apartment buildings and watch this episode happening literally in their own backyard. Even the audio work is top-notch, as it perfectly emulates what it sounds like to walk around Los Angeles, never-ending sirens and all, thanks in part to sound editor Kennedy Phillips, who, and I quote, provided the most terrifying atmosphere he's ever had to design. Oh, and one more thing before I go. Do us all a favor, and for the love of all that is pure and sacred, stop moving out here. We are overcrowded as it is. You're the reason our traffic has its infamous reputation, and literally every LA actor is struggling. We don't need you cutting in on us trying to make a living out here. Oh yeah, and those health warnings about LA water being 98% literal acid, they're not lying. How ironic is it that we're still in a constant drought, and yet the water we do have makes the water in Flint, Michigan look like sparkling champagne. It's terrible. It's all terrible. Living in LA is the worst thing ever. Don't make the same mistake. It's pretty much hell on earth, but at least we're not San Francisco. Back to you, guy I practically stole this whole video from. Hashtag blast! Wow. 
Now I'm starting to think that LA might be short for some other things too. Comedy isn't usually what I go to Hell of a Boss for, that's the characters, but overall, I think they did a good job. However, things take a really emotional turn once we hit the climax. Not only does Blitz have a massive onstage meltdown after a certain Luna flashback, which again, I shall get to, but Luna herself actually tracks down Octi through her Instagram posts, and the two of them share a nice calm bonding moment while overlooking the smog-covered cityscape. Everybody was praising this scene to high heaven, saying that it's an immaculate piece of online animation. And after watching it for myself, well, I guess you could say I was elbow deep in the lost and found at the neurologist's office, because this scene made me lose my mind. In fact, it might be one of my top 10 favorite moments in the whole show. I love pretty much everything about this scene. I love the calm, quiet atmosphere, which gives us a break from the insane craziness we just went through, similar to the emotional moment from Lululand. I love the chill, lo-fi music they play in the background. I love the muted, hazy look of the city over yonder. I love Octi's raw, realistic lines like, why does he hate her more than he loves me, which I imagine struck a chord with people in a similar position to hers. I love how Luna has to take a long pause after hearing that, not really sure how to respond. I mean, she's not a master of sage wisdom, she doesn't have an answer at the ready all the time, she's a young woman who's got her own issues to sort through. And when she finally does talk, it's really simple but effective, kind of like a big sister response, which is fitting for her. It's ironic how she was criticized for not being a people person at the beginning of the episode, and yet here she's shown to be a really good people person when she actually wants to be. I love how the IMP lighter she was using takes a long time before finally working, like a nice visual mirror to the point she made about how her dad keeps screwing up but eventually gets it right in the end. And I love, love, love the way Octi responds to Luna offering her a hand. At first she just passes her the book, thinking that's what she was implying, but then Luna sticks out her hand again as if to say, no, that hand was for you, you dork. And then when this finally registers, she just full body hugs Luna with all her little might. I love sad little subtleties like this. Despite Stolas doing his best to care for her, he does have to put up with his wife more often than not, so it's understandable that this little outlet would be starved for affection most of the time. Plus, she's probably not used to receiving friendly gestures like Luna's since she doesn't have any friends, meaning she doesn't understand this right away. But when affection is offered to her, no matter how small, you can tell that she is extremely grateful for it. Now that Stoa is a non-issue in the Stoa's family, I'm really hoping that we can have more father-daughter time in order to feed that craving for affection she clearly has. Now it is true that I can't really speak for the validity of Luna's advice here since I myself don't come from a dysfunctional household. It's simply a perspective I lack, as I've demonstrated in my older videos. From a purely character standpoint, I can say that Blitz and Stolas do deserve a bit of a break, since their situation is less of a these two are bad dads that are trying their best scenario, and more of a these two are emotionally and mentally damaged disasters that somehow managed to scrape together enough sanity in order to be caring loving parents scenario, but I'm sure there are some people who have more experience with this kind of topic than I do, and if you do, feel free to leave a comment below. I want to know what people who live lives just like these two girls have to say about this scene. With all that being said though, if we judge things purely from an atmosphere standpoint, from a mood standpoint, from an execution standpoint, from a standpoint of whether or not these two characters were portrayed well, I think this whole scene is, for lack of a better word, stellar, and easily one of the biggest highlights of the episode. The two girls portal over to their dads, Octavia and Stolas embrace in a tearful and loving way, and Luna kicks Blitz in the junk when he tries to hug her and then makes him give the grimoire a face high five. Ugh. Okay, good feelings gone. Time to talk about my biggest gripe with this episode. Luna and Blitz's dynamic, at least in my opinion, feels really off balance here. While it does knock it out of the park with two emotional heavy hitter scenes, the rest of their portrayal in this episode just doesn't fit with what we've seen previously. I mean, Blitz's flashback of finding Luna at the pound was great! Not only do we see Luna in the most vulnerable position she's ever been in, which is freaking heartbreaking, but the reasons that Blitz takes such pity on her are so understandable. The pound owner says so many cutting lines when she describes her, like, she'll never amount to anything much at all, which is pretty much a direct mirror to how Blitz's father viewed him when it came to his ambitious circus dreams. So it makes so much sense that he'd want to adopt her to correct the mistakes of his dad and hopefully give her a more encouraging environment to grow up in. But the stuff that happens before and after feels so... backwards. 
First, we have Luna savagely beating the tar out of Blitz after he very delicately criticized her skills at customer service. Now, criticism being one of Luna's triggers is totally fine, since she was probably criticized really harshly throughout her childhood. Heck, the pound owner even throws out criticism right in front of her. But having her snap this violently at Blitz seems like something she would have done maybe within the first week or even first month of her adoption. Not in the current day. I mean, compare this fight to the one they had in Spring Broken. That one was a lot more heated on both sides, with Blitz being far more loud, harsh, and critical of her than he is here. Heck, he basically even criticizes her for the exact same thing, not doing her job. Even though we could all tell that his motives were more so that he doesn't want to lose her, but she doesn't know that, and yet Luna never went primal and attacked him at any point during that scene. It felt real, like an actual argument that a dysfunctional family would have and then promptly forget like it never happened, at least according to my comments. This just felt cartoonishly over the top and really out of place. In fact, when Blitz drops the bomb saying that he might consider replacing Luna, I didn't really feel that bad for her because of that little display she just put on. You can't tell me that the girl who was a half syllable away from calling Blitz dad would do this to him at this point in time. And then at the end, when Blitz tries to hug her, she assaults him again. Twice! I get that she probably wants to keep up her tough persona, especially after such a moment of weakness beforehand, but you could have handled this scene so much better. Like, imagine if Blitz came running to Luna with snuggly intent, and when he ramps his arms around her, she gets very uncomfortable like she did in Truth Seekers, pushing him away like, Blitz, Blitz, it's fine, it's fine, just stop! We're good, okay? But then during their second interaction, instead of trying to hug her, he does something tamer like maybe holding her hand or putting an arm around her while gazing up at the fireworks. She looks down at him annoyed at first, but then she looks up at the sky and smiles, very similar to what she did during the pilot. She's not comfortable with hugging yet, but a little affection is now okay. There, done. Progress is made, she's a reasonable amount of aggressive, everything makes sense. I really want to see more of Luna and Blitz's interactions and just more Luna growth in general, but the way they executed it here just doesn't feel right, and I think they could have handled their dynamic a lot better. Hopefully the fandom doesn't beat the tar out of me for this little bit of criticism. I guess the last thing to mention would be the pacing and the visuals, which really annoyed me at first, but on multiple watches, they weren't really that bad. There were a few pretty scenes like Azathoth's tears in the beginning and the smoggy city near the end, which were both nice to look at. There was a handful of decent facial expressions, and I already tweeted my praises about our favorite Twig's human ensemble, but everything else was just kind of... Meh. There were a few times where things just felt rushed or unfinished, a couple of scenes were missing key components like shadows and other details, and there were even some really bad continuity errors. Like Brendan Blitz completely losing his ears in this scuffle, and then magically having them back in the next scene. Like come on, you can see those Dumbo listeners from space, how the heck did you forget to add them in this scene? The pacing felt way too fast in certain parts, and a couple of scenes definitely could have used more breathing room. Like imagine if Luna's adoption had more setup and atmosphere. It could have been even more of a banger moment than it already was. Oh, and don't even get me started on that scene in the van. It goes from comedic to dramatic to comedic again in the span of 10 seconds, music and all. It almost gave me spring broken flashbacks. Maybe you could have cut out some of the more pointless bits in this episode, like... Oh, I don't know, Eminem subplot? <laughs> I know, I know, it's heresy to want to cut out Best Couple, but seriously, nothing they did in this episode mattered. Like, at all. You could have easily just left them in the office like you usually do with Luna, and given those few extra minutes to the characters and scenes that really needed it. Yeah, their song was nice, and I guess it was interesting to see Millie actually snap at her husband for once, but it really wasn't worthwhile if things were going to be this poorly paced. I get that Ellie stars live their lives in the fast lane, but you didn't have to go this freaking fast. <sighs> I don't know guys, I really tried, but this video was kind of a mess honestly. I guess it mirrors my thoughts on the episode pretty well, right? I swear, I went back and forth so many times when watching this one, and I still think I might have missed a few things. But for the time being, I think we can now officially answer the question. Is seeing stars really the worst of the worst? Honestly, no. Messy? Yes. Confusing? Definitely. Lacking the omnipresent oomph of HB's greatest? Oh yeah, but bottom of the barrel, I can't say that. It had the best of scenes, it had the worst of scenes, it had great emotion, it had flat emotion, it had genius plot points, it had stupid plot points, and the whole thing kind of breaks even to make a solid, decent episode. Not great or incredible, just a flat, decent. 
I know for a fact there are HB fans who consider this thing to be a 4 out of 4 masterpiece. Heck, my own channel poll proves that fact. And hey, if you genuinely do think this is a perfect specimen of Vivzy content, then more power to you. But personally, I really do think this is an episode where the rose-colored glasses need to come off. Both because there are problems that deserve to be addressed, and also because Stoll is more than better, so you should probably just give him back to him. As for the tier list, well, you can imagine that this one's gonna drift more towards the bottom. I guess it's better than Spring Broken with emotional beats that actually hit and more memorable jokes, and it's far better than Cherub, which had some nice style but not much substance. But I can't say that it outranks Murder Family though, since that episode was more tightly written with less pacing issues and a lot more polish. And it's only fair to give credit to an episode that was a smooth ride all the way through, rather than an episode with so many peaks and valleys. So yeah, everybody roll out the blood red carpet for our new B tier celebrity. This episode may not have swept the competition, but I was still able to walk away with a fair amount of dignity and a few award nominations. But overall, what did you guys think? Did you walk out of this episode with glowing reviews, or were you able to see the fault in these stars like I did? Leave your thoughts in the comments below. Thanks for tuning in everybody, and I hope to see you all real soon.